So my first oil painting shortcut is actually a color mixing shortcut, which is using the combination of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna can come in handy a lot. Now it depends on how much of each one you use and how much white you put into it. But I just find myself using this combination of colors for a lot of things. And a lot of things that are hard to figure out what the color of them are. For example, sand. I remember when I first moved to Florida in 2019 and I was plein air painting and I was having a lot of trouble painting sand on the beaches. It actually wasn't until I did a one-on-one -on -one workshop with Bill Farnsworth and he taught me how using a little ultramarine blue and burnt sienna and some white was a quick way to get a sand color. I was like, huh, that's really interesting. He also showed me how you can tone your canvas with that. And that was really helpful too. I just used a little bit of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. It kind of turns out to be almost like a burnt umber, but it's a really good neutral value and also neutral in temperature. It's like not too warm, not too cool. And ever since I learned that, I've always toned my canvases for landscapes that way. Now I think this is a good combination because burnt sienna acts as a red, but it's already pretty desaturated. It's not like a very vibrant red. And so it's good for a lot of things in nature. Like it's really good with tree trunks. If I find myself using that, I'd probably use a little more burnt sienna with the tree trunks to push it red a little more. It's really good with rocks. If you ever have any gray rocks. Speaking of gray, I never think of gray as a color. I think of gray as something I do to a color, like I gray it down. So if you think gray, you're just gonna think, oh, black and then white and then get gray and you're gonna miss the opportunity to have some more interesting colors. And so it's really good for sand, tree trunks, rocks. It's also great for mountains, like the rocks in the mountains. I guess that's rocks too. Like I always struggled getting the light side of the rocks and mountains the right color because in photos it can look very bright and very warm, but it's not as bright and warm as you think it is. So using the burnt sienna, which is already desaturated and working in some blue and some white, is gonna help you get a almost desaturated purple, like kind of like a warm desaturated purple. And it just works really good for the rocks on mountains. It's also helpful when painting pavement I always struggled painting pavement. Like, what color is that? It's in, a lot of times it's like a desaturated purple. Like I just did a painting for Patreon where there was like a sidewalk and I actually chose to make it more red than the photo to contrast with the greens in the landscape because there's a lot of greens and palm trees and greens complement is red. So whenever I can push complement colors, I try to. So I pushed the red in the sidewalk a little bit and I got that color using combination of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. All right, so before I go on to my next oil painting shortcut, I just wanna say that all these shortcuts that I'm gonna be talking about are things that you can just do right away that will help your paintings or at least set you on the right track. I know there's no real shortcut to oil painting, it takes practice, but these are just things that I know that when I heard for the first time, I was like, oh, well that's really helpful to know. So just keep that in mind as we move on to number two, which is know where to put the color in the eye when doing a portrait. A lot of times in photos, it's hard to pick up the color of the eyes. Like a lot of times they're shadowed or a lot of times the photo's just not a good enough quality to pick out that color of the eye. But a little trick to know where to put the color of the eye, because you don't want to just put it on the whole thing, is put it on the opposite side of the little dot of reflected light. See, when light hits the eye, part of it gets reflected where it's hitting and that's the little reflected light, which is everybody's favorite part to paint. But the light actually goes through the eye and comes out on the other side and that's where you're gonna get the most color. Now a lot of times you can see this in the photo, it's easy to pick up, but sometimes it's not. But since now that you know it, you're not gonna be limited by a subpar photo. I remember exactly when I learned this, is when I got Michael Shane Neal's book, Portrait Painting, My Point of View. And I just remember reading that and being like, oh, that is very helpful to know. All right, shortcut number three is paint it small first. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, if you have an idea for a big painting, and when I say big, I mean anything bigger than 16 by 20 inches, try and paint it small first. I always say if you can't get it to work in like a little three by four inch study, or even like a six by eight, it's not gonna look any better when you blow it up to 16 by 20, 18 by 24. It's actually gonna probably look worse because your mistakes are gonna be amplified. And you don't have to spend a lot of time on these. You know, 30 or 40 minutes will save you so many headaches when you actually move to the bigger painting because in these little small ones, it's gonna be easy to figure things out, to test out colors and values. 
You're gonna understand the big shapes and the big forms. Like it blows my mind when I look back to all the big paintings I started without ever doing any kind of sketch whatsoever. And a lot of times it led to so many headaches and so much like reworking on a big painting which takes forever and can get very demoralizing. Like now I can't imagine starting a painting without doing a little sketch of it first. Even portraits, doing like a small little study with no detail can help you so much just figuring out the light patterns, like how the lights hit in the face. What are the colors? What are the big shapes? What are the big values? Painting small is such a shortcut to you figuring out what makes a painting really work. And it's not the details. It's the composition, the drawing, the big shapes, and the big values, which can all be figured out in a small little study. All right, number four is don't go too white too quickly. What I mean is when you're mixing up a color and you need to make it lighter, don't just immediately go from white to lighten the color. I see students do that a lot. What happens is their colors get very chalky and don't have quite as much punch to them. An example of this is if you're painting the leaves in a tree and you got the shadowed side of the tree and it's a dark green and now you need to make a lighter green for the leaves that are getting hit with sunlight, you don't wanna go to white. Yes, it will make the green lighter, but you're gonna wash out your color. A way to think about it is green is made up of blue and yellow. Now blue is a darker value and yellow is a lighter value. So start by trying to mix a green that has a little more yellow in it. Now yes, you're still gonna have to play around with it and add red to desaturate it and mess around, but you can get a lighter value green without using any white. Now, yes, sometimes you will need to use white, but in my experience teaching, students go to it way sooner than they should. All right, this week's video is brought to you by HelloFresh. I'm actually really into health and fitness. So when HelloFresh said they wanted to sponsor a video, I was like, absolutely. I'm super busy painting and making videos. So it's so nice to be able to skip the store, skip the lines and spend more time painting, knowing I'm gonna have chef crafted recipes delivered right to my door. HelloFresh now has 40 weekly recipes to choose from. They're all so good. I had such a hard time figuring out which one I was gonna make, but I ended up going with the tacos. <laughs> and it's so great because I'm not that great of a cook. So having their easy to follow recipe cards with step-by-step -step instructions and pictures just made it super easy. And everything is super fresh. In fact, the ingredients go from the farm to your table in less than seven days. It's just been so nice week after week not having to worry about going to the store or ordering expensive takeout. So go to hellofresh.com and use the code paintcoach65 for 65% 65 off plus free shipping. These tacos were so good that I ate them all within like two minutes. So again, go to hellofresh.com and use the promo code paintcoach65 for 65% off plus free shipping. All right, back to the video. All right, number five also has to deal with color, which is branch off from colors on your palette. Meaning like start with a mother pile of color and when you need variations of that color, start with that color. Does that make sense? I actually didn't pick up on this until I saw enough of students' palettes, like when they would take a picture of their painting and like post it and you could see their palette too. I'd be like, whoa, like their palette is just a bunch of like isolated little piles everywhere. Like it doesn't seem like there's any organic branching off from one pile and making it lighter, you know, branching off, making it cooler or warmer. It was like every single time they need a new color, they just started a new pile. And one, I feel like it gives your painting color harmony because they're being derived a lot of times from the same pile of paint. But also I feel like it helps me mentally, like the physical act of like understanding how I'm getting to a certain color. It's like, all right, I have this color and now it's going further into the distance. So I'm gonna push it a little more blue. Or it's like, oh, like it's not, it's too saturated. I wanna make a desaturated version. So I'm gonna, you know, push a little more of its complement. Like, oh, I need to add a little more white. I'm gonna push it a little more white. It just helps things make more sense in my mind than just a bunch of ugh, different colors all splattered around my palette. All right, quick side note here. If you struggle with color mixing, I actually offer the color mixing video from my Foundations of Oil Painting course for free. If you wanna check that out, there's a link to it in the description of this video. All right, number six is always try and start with the darkest light that you can. What I mean by that is when you're blocking out your painting, 
In a lot of my videos, I've talked about how I like to block out my paintings with big shapes of flat color, you know, blocking out the shadow family and the light family. But when it comes time to blocking out the light family or just any light shapes, try and start with the darkest light that you can because you wanna be able to build lighter values on top of that. With oil paint, it's a lot easier to work dark to light than light to dark. It's just a lot easier to lighten paint as you go opposed to darken it as you go. A lot of times I see students start out too bright and they don't have anywhere else to go to make it lighter. And they either one, make it too bright and put a ton of white in it to make up the value difference, or they just leave it. And the area kind of ends up looking flat because they don't have any smaller value shapes to create form. All right, number seven is go extreme with your composition. Now composition is a big subject, and but I think a great place to start is to make your composition extreme. Now what I mean by that is make very strong decisions, especially with landscapes. I always say take the part of the landscape that you find the most interesting and make it take up as much space on the canvas as you can. So if you're painting some mountains and you really like the mountains, put the horizon low and make those mountains take up as much of the canvas as possible. If you like a big set of trees, place them so they take up as much of the canvas as you can. If it's a river or you know, body of water that you like, put the horizon line up high. So most of the painting is that stream or body of water. The last thing you want is to have everything in the painting taken up pretty much the same amount of space. That's not very dynamic and it gets very boring. And it's hard because your initial instincts are to look at a landscape and be like, oh, like I really like the sky and I like that river and I like that tree and that mountain. And you think, oh, like I wanna incorporate all these as much as I can. And when you do that, you just end up dividing the attention to all of them and not one element has all the attention. You always want one star of the painting. All right, number eight is tone your canvas. Now, as I said before, I like to do this a lot with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, because if you started on plain white, any value you put on it would look really dark because it's right next to white. But with a neutral value, you're gonna have a better gauge. You're starting in the middle of the value scale. And a thing you can do to help you with values that involves toning your canvas is making a value map. A lot of times I will draw out my subject and then block out the major values using the tone canvas as my mid-tone. I always try and block paintings out in three values, a dark, a mid-tone, and a light. So if I already have a mid-tone, I can block out my darks, and then I can actually take some paper towel, dip it in a little bit of paint thinner, and pull off some paint for the lights. And this is just a great way to start a painting because you've mapped out the values, and it's gonna act as such a helpful guide once you start adding colors. I also just found it helpful to start a painting the same way every time because you get familiar with it and you get comfortable with it and you need some sort of consistency to progress and get better. It's similar to people that like to have a morning routine. Like it's how you start your day and it grounds you. And I feel like that's the same way with toning my canvas. Like every time I start, tone my canvas, block out my values and I'm on my way. All right, number nine is Photoshop is totally worth it in my opinion. Now, yeah, it's not cheap. I think you can get it for like 20 bucks a month, but I just honestly use it so much. I mean, yeah, I use it a lot for teaching, but even not teaching, like there's so many cool aspects to Photoshop that can help you with painting. One, they have like the color picker, so you can go through and kind of pick out colors and see what they are, see how saturated they are, how desaturated they are. You can easily put a grid on your painting if you need uh, help drawing. You can crop your painting to certain dimensions to fit a certain size canvas that you have. You can rearrange compositions to get a better idea of what something will look like. And the thing I probably use the most are the filters. These are really helpful just to get you to th see things a lot more simply. Like you can put a blur filter on it that will just get rid of detail. And that will help me a lot kind of see what is going on before I start painting. It's also good for exercises. I've done exercise where I will purposely use a blurred version of the photo, at least for the beginning of the painting, so I don't get caught up in details and I just see the big shapes. There's also like the palette knife filter that helps simplify things in the big shapes, or the cutout filter. I actually just used the cutout filter for a tutorial on Patreon. It was like a portrait tutorial. It was the cutout filter and it just broke up the face into big connected shapes to kind of help show you how simply you can paint a portrait and how much of it relies on 
these big shapes and getting the right value of these shapes. I can also put photos in there and, you know, adjust the brightness, I can adjust the contrast. You know, I can fix a photo as much as I can before I start painting. So if you're on the fence about Photoshop, I highly recommend it. All right, and number 10 is try to paint on linen if you can. Now I love painting on canvas. I've painted a ton of great paintings on canvases. But if you haven't tried linen, it's definitely worth a try. It's gonna be a finer weave, it's gonna be smoother, and I just personally like it a lot. It's great because there actually are some more reasonably priced linen products out there. Like most of the time, linen panels or canvases are just insanely expensive. But there's companies like uh, Centurion, which makes oil primed linen and uh, acrylic primed linen. I suggest the acrylic primed, the, the oil primed can be a little slick which some painters like, like I like using that sometimes. Um, but if you're just starting out, you'll probably like the acrylic prime more. And I've, so I've used those so much in the past, like their linen panels. They just, I think they just started selling them on Amazon. But the ones I've been using lately are a little bit better. It's the Fredericks uh, oil primed linen panels. I've been liking those a lot. I, they are a little more expensive, but for me, in my circumstances, I think it's worth it. All right, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. If you'd like to see what I'm painting on a daily basis, you can follow me on Instagram at Forza43. I'm Chris Fornatero here telling you to go get painting.